Welcome everyone to today's IEEE online final year PhD student seminar. And the talk today will be given by Daniel Arnström, who has been a PhD at Linköping University for a little less than five years. Uh, he's already published um, 12 papers, which is pretty darn good in my book. Uh, and besides the publication, he's also coded the certifiable QP solver that we're going to hear about today. Uh, so theory and practice. Uh, and Daniel will defend his thesis in June this year. So if you want to hire him, you should probably contact him soon. Uh, the title of the talk is Reliable Active Set Solvers for Real-Time Model Predictive Control. So the floor is yours, Daniel. Thank you very much for that, Peter. So um, I will jump right into the motivation behind this work. And uh, that is the control of real-time systems. So here we have three typical real-time systems, uh, which we think about when we say real-time systems. And what they have in common is that to operate correctly, they have to abide to some deadlines. Uh, but not only are these uh, systems real-time systems, they are in fact hard real-time systems. And that is that they can never miss a deadline because doing so would be catastrophic. For example, for the self-driving car, it might not have time to um, give way to pedestrians. The airplane might miss the landing strip and the pacemaker might not working might lead to cardiac arrest. Um, so it's very important to have worst case guarantees on um, the operation of these uh, kind of systems. Uh, and this is the main focus of uh, my research and the research that I will present here. So the worst case execution time of what exactly? Well, I'm interested in the control problem, which very abstractly ends uh, selecting a control action given the current state, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, so for example, if we have a robot, we might want to control its pose, and we do so by collecting some uh, or computing some mo motor input to the system. And classically, these controllers have been PID controllers or LPR controllers. And uh, from a real-time perspective, they are really nice because the worst case execution time for these kind of controllers is, is trivial. It's just uh, a finite number of multiplications and additions that, that is very uh, easy to determine. However, the more recent trend uh, for controlling advanced systems uh, is to use model predictive control, where we instead formulate the control problem as an optimization problem. So essentially what we do is that we have an internal model of the system that we want to control, and then we simulate the system using the current state, and then we pick an optimal control action in some sense and apply that to, to the system. And then by repeating this in each time step, so we solve an optimization problem in each time step, given the current state, and we get an optimal control action, we get feedback. So in real-time MPC, we are faced with these real-time constraints that I talked about before. And moreover, often the controllers are implemented on, limit, uh, on hardware with limited computing power and memory, which can make it quite challenging to actually satisfy these real-time time constraints or at least know if we will be able to do that. So our ultimate objective is to be able to provide guarantees on satisfying these real-time constraints. In other words, that we're able to solve these optimization problems within the limited time frame that we, we have uh, been allocated. And this ultimate objective can be approached from two kind of complementary directions. Uh, so the first one is by developing efficient optimization solvers that are using MPC. Uh, and specifically here, we will focus on linear MPC. So then we want to solve a quadratic program in each time step. And here I've listed some uh, popular uh, solvers that are have come from the control community. And specifically, I will talk a bit about one solver that we have recently developed called DATP. But then the other complementary direction is to develop complexity certification methods for already existing solvers. And here I list some work that uh, has been done on that in the context of uh, MPC. And uh, the main bulk of this presentation will be a framework that we recently uh, have published for active set solvers. That is one class of solvers that are very popular in, in MPC. So, so that will be the main part of this presentation. But before jumping into that, 
uh, let's make things a bit more concrete of the problems that we want to solve. So it's very a very well-known result uh, within the control community that linear MPC problems can be recast as a multi-parametric quadratic program. So we have an optimization problem of this form where we have a quadratic objective and we have affine constraints. And then here the decision variable denoted X is related to the control action that we want to de determine. And then we also have a parameter denoted theta, which enters in the linear term of our objective function and the right-hand side of our constraints. And this parameter is related to the system state. So each different parameter defines a different quadratic program, which we then can solve to, to get an optimal control action given the current state. In turn, this means that when the parameter changes or when the state changes, then that means that we have to solve a different quadratic program, which in turn means that there might be different computational effort in the Cooper solver that we deploy to solve uh, these problems. So kind of the main problem formulation that we're interested in is this. So given a Cooper solver and a multi-parametric quadratic program, what is the worst case computational effort required to find a solution for all parameters of interest? And specifically, as I've said, we're interested in active set QP solvers. So that's, uh, that's our focus here. And when I say active set solvers and worst case computational effort, then some of you that are familiar with this topic might shudder a bit because it's kind of notorious, uh, the worst case complexity for active set methods. So a very famous result by Clementi is that in theory, the worst case complexity is exponential. Uh, so they famously show this for the simplex method. However, in practice, things are a bit more optimistic. Often they are really fast in practice and we just observe a polynomial complexity. Uh, but I mean, th this is kind of the general case. So we have something theory and then in practice, it's something else and we want to close this gap. And um, that is one of the goals with, with the research that I will present here. And what makes it possible for us to actually close this gap is that we are only interested in quadratic programs that arise for a given MPC problem, not all possible QPs, because this pathological example by Clean Minty was for like when you can't pick any, any possible QP. But we are only restricted to this limited subset of problems that are parametricized by this parameter theta that I described before. So maybe we can leverage this parametric structure somehow to get more tight complexity uh, guarantees. And that is exactly what we've done. Um, but an AE way that people also often use this parametric structure, and this is often used in practice, is to sample the parameter space and then run the solver for each QP. Um, so, so an example is, we can see here, so we have a two-dimensional parameter space. And um, remember that each point here represents a possible optimization problem that we might need to solve online. So in this naive approach, what one would do is that one picks some samples here and then solve the corresponding quadratic program, record how difficult it was to solve. Uh, and then that's exactly what I've done here. And I plotted uh, the number of iteration in this case. Uh, so this is just for 10 samples, but then you can take a bit more samples to get a, a fuller picture of what's going on here. And then you might end up with something that looks like this. So here, Maybe it's the worst case is 11 iterations. Uh, it seems plausible. However, a main drawback with these method methods is that there will always be holes because we're limited to a finite number of samples. So we can never guarantee that we've actually seen the worst case. There might be a very pathological example hiding in one of these holes here, and we can never guarantee that we've actually missed one when we do this sampling-based approach. And this becomes even worse when we increase the dimension of the parameter space because of the curse of the dimensionality. It becomes harder and harder to actually cover space with samples. So it, it becomes more likely that we actually miss an important problem. So I, I call this the naive approach. Then is there something that's better uh, that we could do? And the answer is yes. Uh, so we have proposed an alternative approach how one would go about this. And the main idea is to partition the parameter space depending on how the solver behaves. Um, so abstractly here, I've called, we have some solver state, uh, Q, uh, and it might be easier if, if I give you an example of how, how this works. So again, we have a two-dimensional parameter space, 
And for simplicity, let's say that we start the solver the same everywhere. So for all problems, we have the same initial state. And then the idea is to run the solver one iteration parametrically. So we run one iteration simultaneously for all problems in a sense. And then we might end up with something that looks like this. So in some regions, uh, this initial state was in fact the optimal one. So it's have converged directly. In other states, the solver state will, up, will update. So this is after one iteration. And then we run yet another one. In more regions will terminate. We will update uh, the solver state in others. And then we can continue like this until all regions have terminated. And then in fact, what we have here is the worst case number of iterations, or we have the iterations for any possible problem everywhere. And as a subset of that information is the worst case number of iterations. So in this case, it was four iterations. Um, and I also want to emphasize here that we have a lot more information than just the number of iterations. We have the exact sequence of solver states everywhere in the parameter space or for any possible problem that we might have solved. And I will come back to that shortly, how we can actually leverage that to get even tighter complexity bounds. Um, but this kind of partitioning approach we have proposed in a recent publication in uh, transactions on automatic control. And of course, I've skipped over here the important part. I mean, how do we actually do this partitioning? And uh, for those technical details, I, I refer to, to the paper. But the main idea is to partition the parameter space. And kind of to drive home what the big benefits here is with compared with the naive method is that this is the result that our method can, can produce. So we have a full coverage of parameter space. We know exactly all the possible problems. What will be the worst case number of iterations? Well, in the naive approach, we might get something like this. And maybe this captures the worst case. I mean, in this case, we have some problems that take 11 iterations, but we can never be sure here. And I wouldn't really trust this to actually capture all possible uh, uh, cases. Okay, so that's kind of the general certification framework. Uh, but I've only talked about algorithmic complexity things here. So I've talked about the iterations, we have the sequence of solver state, but we want to go all the way and have worst case execution time, not only worst case number of iterations. So this is work that we're currently doing and currently writing up. So this kind of completed work, but we, we're um, uh, yeah, finishing it. Um, so what I just described before was this complexity certification framework. We have a parametric problem, we have an active set solver, and then we get some algorithmic complexity things. So the number of iterations, for example. But when we want to determine the worst case execution time, then things like the implementation of the solver becomes important which compiler we use, which hardware we deploy the program on. And this is not captured by this uh, complexity certification method that I described before. But the main idea or the main insight that, that uh, took us from this algorithmic complexity to the programmatic complexity, we say, or the worst case execution time, is that from the resu result here, we get what we call archetypal problems. So if we take one sample in each region that this partition, uh, the, the, this partition that we have regenerated, then we can in fact capture the behavior for all possible problems. So we, we, we only have to check a finite number of sub problems. And the idea then is to combine the program that we have compiled with these archetypal problems and then actually execute it on the hardware where we want to deploy uh, our controller or our optimization method. And then we measure the time, and then we can get the exact worst case uh, execution time. Um, so the key idea here is that a single problem can capture the behavior of an entire region. So we only have to pick one sample in each uh, of this region that the previous uh, presented complexity certification method had produced. So this is very neat. I mean, here we get exact worst case execution time. And there are some details here. I mean, of course, when you employ it here, you have to think a bit of cache effects and other like time invariant things in the hardware. Uh, so yeah, those are details that I won't uh, expand upon here, but I'm glad to discuss it uh, afterwards if you're interested. Um, okay, so then you might say, fine. Um, or well, what, what can we do with this then? Uh, so one example of 
the possible analysis that this uh, allows is, is what I show here. So now we have a similar plot. One point here represents a possible uh, uh, optimization problem that we might have to solve. But now we show the number of processor cycles that is required. And here we also show it for two different compiler options. So here we said that do all possible optimization in the compiler. And here we turn off all the optimization. And not surprisingly, we see that, I mean, we require a significantly lower amount of cycles. But this is just to exemplify that, I mean, now we can start to tweak a bunch of compiler flags and actually get exactly how that will affect the real-time performance of our controller, which is uh, pretty neat, I think. And uh, this was the extreme case, but maybe more like problem-dependent features as loop on, on rolling and, and such things can actually be optimized uh, with this framework now. OK, so now you might say, OK, it's a cool framework. You can certify. Uh, the uh, worst is time for these uh, solvers, but are they actually relevant solvers? Are, are these usable in practice? And fortunately for us, the answer is yes to that. So here's a plot for, from another publication that we recently had in transactional automatic control. And the, the red plot here is uh, the solver that we proposed in that article. Uh, and that here we compare it with a bunch of other popular solvers that are used in, in real-time MPC. So uh, OSQP and QBASIS, I guess those are pretty popular in the robotics community and HPIPM is, is uh, increasing in popularity. But we can see here that, I mean, the solver that we propose that is covered by the certification framework is about an order of magnitude faster for this particular example. This was uh, an air aircraft uh, example, a very popular like benchmark problem uh, for MPC uh, QP solvers. Um, so not only, I mean, is this solver certifiable, but it's actually performs very well in practice, which is, uh, which is a good combination. So, I won't have time here to go into all of the technical details uh, lying behind the uh, optimization solvers. There are a bunch of tweaks that makes it actually fast in practice. But again, I, I'm happy to discuss any of the details uh, afterwards if you're interested. Instead, I will kind of put on my sales hats now in the end of uh, the presentation and uh, show you some features of, of this uh, or highlight some features of this uh, Cupid solver. So one thing that I've shown is that it's very efficient for medium-sized QPs. Uh, another is that it's easily warm started. So that's a feature of active set methods that you can reuse uh, previous solves that you've done to initialize the solver. And that often saves a lot of computations. Um, so that's another nice property. Then also it's numerically stable, which also, it's also inherits from being an active set method. Uh, it's readily embeddable. I will come back to that uh, shortly. And then since it's covered by this framework that I've described in the beginning of the presentation, it's also real-time certifiable. So these are all important properties when you want to employ the solver in, in real time. Um, so the solver is open source uh, under a permissive license. It's written in C and it's library free. And this is what make it, makes it uh, readily embeddable. I mean, you only need a basic C compiler uh, to, to make this run. Uh, but there are also a, a bunch of high-level interfaces if you want to use it uh, so to simplify the, the use. So there's one in Julia and MATLAB and, and in Python. Uh, and again, here is the link if you're interested in the solver. So to conclude then, uh, uh, some of the takeaways. First off, that we have proposed this complexity certification framework for active set methods. So this kind of notoriety of active set methods is, is not really fair anymore in real-time MPC applications, at least for medium-sized uh, problems, uh, because now we can say something about the guarantee. It's not exponential that people often said in practice. And also, uh, we have also recently proposed this DAQP, which is an efficient QP solver that is covered by this framework. And it's efficient and is covered by this uh, framework, which is a good combination in real-time applications. 
So taken together, then we get reliable and efficient MPC for a hard real time system. So at least it's a start towards that. But then people also have to um, incorporate this in the bigger uh, software stack. And if you're interested in the certification part, there's also a software package in Julia called Ascertain that does this partitioning. Uh, so check that out if you're interested. And again, the solver is available here at GitHub also. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. That was very cool. So do, do we have, yeah, let's have some virtual applause here. Yeah. Oh, there we are. <clears throat> yeah, so any questions? Hands up. Uh, if you have any questions for Daniel. Okay, uh, I have one question, but it maybe it's uh, well, we'll see. Uh, so you show this picture where you kind of the naive approach was kind of sampling problems and seeing how long time they took, how many iterations they took, uh, and then you have this clever way of kind of partitioning this space and covering kind of a, a polygon. Uh, could you, and I think you kind of hinted that it, there was some complexity there that you swooped over, but could you maybe give some intuition for what's happening there? Yeah, I, I mean, the thing is basically you have to write down the solvers and what happens in each iteration and then see how like the param parametric structure propagates through the solver. And so it's basically you have to write down exactly the solver and try to understand what happens parametrically in each step. So you want to, in some sense, propagate a set through the solver and see what happens. Uh, and of course, to do that, I mean, you have to actually go into exactly the details in the solver. And I think maybe that's a bit out, out of scope uh, in this context. But the idea so, is to propagate the parametric set through the solver and see, see what happens in each, each iteration. Is it something like what, what constraints are active and not active? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, in active set methods, you add uh, or remove uh, sets from uh, or constraints from the active set. So, I mean, here, what I like abstracted away and called the solver state is actually the active set or the working set that, that people call it. So, so I mean, each, each partition here depends on which constraint that you add to the active set. Um, so, in an iteration like here in the beginning, I mean, maybe here I added the, the first constraint and maybe here I added the second constraint to the active set in the solver in an iteration. So, so yeah, you're completely correct there that it has to do with active constraints. Cool. Uh, there's a question or a statement in the chat. Uh, do you have access to the chat, Daniel? Uh, not really. <laughs> okay, I can read it for you. The, it's from NPN01. Uh, the naive approach suffered from the curse of dimensionality. Is it any problem when the dimensions increase for your approach? Well, sure. I mean, it, it will take longer time, but it's not really the parameter, um, parameter dimension that's the real problem here. It's more like the number of constraints that you have in, in your problem. Because uh, as I just mentioned, uh, when you partition this, is is based on how the active set changes. And if you have more constraints in your problem, then there will be more possibilities of which uh, which constraint is added or removed, and that will uh, quickly like increase the how fine the partition becomes. Uh, so then it might take a lot of time. But but what I meant before is that it doesn't suffer from the curse of dimensionality in the sense that we still have full coverage. It's just that it's more take more time to get this full coverage but in the sample based approach i mean even if you take 100 million samples i mean you, you will still have holes somewhere and you might mm -hmm. miss something it's just that you decrease the probability of actually missing something but uh, we actually have a continuous coverage of the entire parameter space yeah. mm -hmm. cuz you cover kind of a volume at a time as opposed to just exactly. a point 
Exactly. Uh, and there's a comment. Thanks. And thanks for a good presentation by this NPN01 intriguing um, uh, individual. Uh, okay, so uh, more questions. Great, uh, thanks. That was really interesting. So um, let's see if we can get the virtual applaud going once more. Thank you. Yeah, the crowd is roaring right now. So um, thanks for joining and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. <laughs>